afternoon, friends. We're midweek now through our Holy Week pilgrimage, and I invite you to take your worship guide and open the hymnal to 191, my, one of my favorite Lenten hymns and Lenten texts, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Then put your worship guide inside the hymnal and stand with me together as we read responsibly to begin our service this day. Let us test and examine our ways, and return to the Lord. God has blessed us. Let all the ends of the earth fear Him. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous ones their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken spirit in my life. Coming our way. 
Our speaker this week has been from among this church. He is one of us, and we gladly claim Nash Wills uh, as uh, one of the children of Mountain Brook Baptist Church. Certainly his parents, Reed and Joe Wills, have blessed our congregation, and uh, Nash's brother, Ed, the extended Wills family, such gifts to our church, but uh, Nash is as well, and for us uh, to have had the privilege to have nurtured uh, Nash in his faith development to the point that he has answered God's call uh, to ministry uh, at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Columbia, Alabama, where he's been 11 <coughs> years, the last almost two years as the pastor of the church. I think it's uh, a fascinating uh, turn, Nash, that uh, God has led you from being on staff there as Minister of Music and Youth now to become pastor. And uh, I think that's wonderful. And it's uh, a real testimony to how you have endeared yourself to that congregation and how they have recognized uh, gifts in you. And uh, we pray that as you return uh, to Columbia, that uh, God will continue to smile upon your ministry. We wish you a most blessed Easter. Remember that uh, tomorrow we will not have the noon service. Instead, we will be gathering in the sanctuary at 6.30 for our Maundy Thursday service. And uh, our choir has been working so hard uh, to prepare for that service. I trust that you will be able to be in attendance. Uh, we will be observing the Lord's Supper as a part of that service. And then on Friday, we will be back here uh, in the chapel. Uh, we are blessed to have Nash with us and to have uh, been encouraged by his preaching before he preaches the last message. Uh, he will lead us in song along with Brother Ed. So what a treat we have in store for us. As Nash, you come, and Ed, you come as well.
learned how to do the sound. <laughs> and, um, but this is, I believe, the second time we have ever sung a duet. And it's been too long. Last time we did it was at Holy Week Services in Leeds, Alabama, about 15 years ago. So let's not let it be another 15 years before we do that again. Thank you. Well, again, I just want to. Thank Pastor George. I want to thank Mount Baptist Church for the invitation to come and speak. I tell you, it's been a tremendous, tremendous blessing. And again, in full transparency, I have to be totally honest. I was fairly terrified leading up to this event um, because it's it's really intimidating to speak to folks who had such a prominent role in the foundation of my faith. And anything that I ever do for the Lord, I owe it to you as well. Because without the foundation that I received here, I wouldn't be in the position that I am today, and that's for sure. God has truly had his hand upon my life, and that started right here. And so I just thank you. And I also, I love the church. And so I love it when the church does a good job of being the church. So I want to personally and publicly thank Mount Road Baptist Church for how you have wrapped your arms around us, especially since my dad's passing. Because I tell you, the love that we have received from here has just been fantastic. So thank you so, so very much. I think as people, we continue to grow. Not only in stature. I mean, I've had a lot of people remind me of when I was this big here at this church. And as you can't tell, I'm not that big anymore. I'm kind of bigger. But I think we continue to grow not only physically... But I think we continue to grow emotionally, we continue to grow intellectually. And I tell you, there's kind of two schools of thought on how that growth should take place. There's some people that think you need to find something that you are very good at and really pour into that subject so you become a true expert. And I think that's a great thing to do. But then there's kind of the other side of the coin that says you need to find something you're not that good at and really try to learn about it so you can become a more well-rounded person. Well, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. And as a society, I think there's something that we are really not very good at. And it's something that we need to grow in our ability to do, and that is to be still. We are not good as a society at being still. I don't know about you, but in my house at home, there are more TVs than we have people. And one or two are just about always on because we just don't like quiet. I frequently have earphones in my head, in my ears because listening to music, sometimes listening to books on tape, listening to podcasts, because I just don't like quiet. It's not something I'm comfortable with. And I think as a society, we are robbing ourselves of some wonderful times with God when we're not quiet. Now, why would I bring all this up today? Well, as you know, our study in Holy Week this week, we have been preparing ourselves for the crucifixion and preparing ourselves for the resurrection by seeing how Jesus prepared himself. And yesterday, if you'll remember, we talked about Jesus being so incredibly busy. I mean, I, I read a list typed, it was about that big of a paragraph of all the things that Jesus taught on the Tuesday before the crucifixion. Because he was a true teacher and because he truly loved his audience. We too are to teach. We are too to reflect God's love in everything we do. And his love should be our motivation for everything that we do for him. Well, today, the Wednesday before the crucifixion, was a totally different day for Jesus. You want to know what the Bible tells us that he did on the Wednesday before crucifixion? Nothing. Seems kind of surprising, doesn't it? Just really one day away from his arrest and his trial, two days away from his crucifixion, don't you think the gospel writers would have something to tell us of some tremendous spiritual significance here? And I think they do. And they tell us by their silence. Because the reality is this day that we have recorded or not recorded in the gospels is much like every other day of Jesus' ministry. Of his over three years of public ministry, we really have very little information that the Holy Spirit led the Gospel writers to record. And again, I think that's because, not because Jesus didn't do anything noteworthy on this day, but I think 
the gospel writers give us enough information that we can make some good, educated guesses at what Jesus was about. I feel that Jesus spent Wednesday preparing himself by investing in the two most important relationships he had. One was with his disciples. He had that core of 12 men, and even an inner core within those 12, that he spent considerable time and considerable energy pouring into. But that's not all. I think he also spent a tremendous amount of time pouring into his relationship with the Father. Because he knew he was about to face something very difficult. And we think of the crucifixion as difficult, and, and especially since the movie The Passion of the Christ came out, we are well informed of the physical side of everything Jesus went through. And I'm not going to say I like the movie The Passion of the Christ, but I am going to say I think it's good for us to remember all that he went through for us. I have some friends that disagree with that, and I'm fine with that. But I think we need to remember the lengths of his love. And Mel Gibson did a wonderful job of portraying the physical side of the crucifixion, but that's not why Jesus was sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the spiritual side that the movie couldn't have touched on. But the reality is, Jesus found himself in a place where the Father had to turn away. And why was that? It was because of our sin. Our sin. You see, it's our sin, not his, that caused God to turn his face away. And, and I really think that's what he was really preparing for. You see, Jesus didn't do things the way we do. You know, Jesus had a very long day on Tuesday, and I can imagine after a long day, the first thing you want to do the next day is get some rest, right? We rest to recuperate. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think Jesus prayed to prepare. He kind of turned that whole equation around compared to what we do. And I really think that we often get our ratios mixed up on how much we should be praying and how much we should be doing. Because if we look in the first chapter of Acts, Right? There were 50 days between the resurrection and Pentecost. 40 of those days, Jesus was here appearing to his disciples, appearing to groups of people. But for 10 days between the time when Jesus ascended, he told, them, he told the disciples and all of his believers to go into Jerusalem and await the gift. And so they spent 10 days. And what were they doing during those 10 days? All of these, according to Acts 1.14, all of these Christ's followers were continually united in prayer. See, Peter prayed for 10 days, preached for 10 minutes, and thousands came to the Lord. How often do we pray for 10 seconds, go work for 10 hours, and feel good that we have done things for the Lord? There is nothing wrong with working for the Lord. That's exactly what we're called to do, and I don't want to see us do less of that. But I do think we need to realize and invest in our prayer life more. Jesus prayed a lot. He prayed for others. Matthew 19, 13 says, Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. He prayed for others. I hope we do too. He prayed with others. Luke 9, 28 says, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. It's important that we gather together as a family of believers and pray with one another. What do we pray for? Yes. Everything. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray for this church. We need to pray for other churches. We need to pray for everyone who proclaims the gospel this coming Sunday. We need to pray that their efforts will be incredibly fruitful. Because this good news that we have is not designed for us to keep. It's for us to share. And the wonderful thing is, is by sharing, we don't have any less. As a matter of fact, I think we have a little more. So we need to share the good news. We need to pray. But most of all, Jesus prayed alone. Luke 5, 16 says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. 
And I think that's what we're not as good at. Well, let me rephrase that. I, I don't know many of y'all well enough to make that determination. That's what I am not as good at. I am not good at going away for hours on end and doing nothing but pray. I get easily distracted. And my prayer life suffers for it. But you know why I'm not good at it? Because I don't do it enough. Just like anything else, the more you do something, the easier it gets. And in my preparations for Easter this year, I need to be more of a prayer warrior than I am. And I think that because that was Jesus' example to us. Now, why would Jesus Christ, the Son of God, one of the members of the Trinity, why would he need to pray so much? Like I said yesterday, he knows that's where the source of his power is. The song that Ed and I sang earlier has a very simple message. It's a very profound message. What does it say? It says, we serve a great God. How do I know that I serve a great God? First of all, because I serve him. I've seen him at work in my life. I have seen him at work in the lives of others. I have seen him defy the odds. About six months ago, we had this little storm down my way called Hurricane Michael. And we had, in my little church, we probably had 25 or 26 families who had trees down on their property. Only one had several trees on a house. All the other houses were habitable. We needed some new roofs. We needed some work done on some barns. A lot of them got squished. But I tell you, I went to so many houses that had trees falling in three different directions, all of them away from the house. I went to someone who lived in a mobile home who had a trailer fall so close to both sides they couldn't open the doors. But nothing hit the mobile home. And the mobile home wasn't blown over, which is a miracle in and of itself. God is a great God. We serve a great God. And I think that needs to be in our hearts and in our minds all of the time. You see, Jesus knew he had to plug into that source of power. And I firmly believe that Jesus spent a lot of time Wednesday praying just that. Psalm 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of Jesus knew he was getting ready to experience some troubling times, some difficult times. And he knew the only way that he was going to be able to get through these difficult times was the help of his Heavenly Father. Has anybody here ever had some troubling times? Yes, we all have. Everybody has had troubling times. And how do we get through those difficult times? You've got two choices. You can struggle with them. Or you can snuggle in the lap of your Savior. Let me tell you, I've tried both. I know for me which one works best. And that's to spend time with Jesus. He was asking God to help him with the most terrifying thing he could ever experience. And that's for his father to turn his face away. Isaiah 59, 2 states, But your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God, and your sins have made him hide his face from you, so that he does not listen. Now, Isaiah was talking to a rebellious people, right? Isaiah was talking to stiff-necked people, to use Moses' terminology. But are we that much different? I don't know about you, but I see it in myself. A lot of times what I'm stubborn about the most is my own sin that I kind of like. <clears throat> and the way we deal with that is to simply spend time with God in prayer. And He will show us where we don't conform to the image that we're supposed to. He will help us to change those thoughts. He will help us to prepare us to face any trial that this world can throw our way. <clears throat> As another great hymn says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Really? All fear? Yeah. If we're really invested in our relationship with God like we ought to be, yes. Our God is not a God of fear. 
Again, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus took upon himself all of the sins of the world, all who ever had lived, all who were living then, and all who ever would live. Because of that, that is why Jesus uttered the phrase, the words from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what he had to prepare for. And I am so glad he did, because if he hadn't, I know exactly where I'd be, and that's the law. But because we serve a great God, and we have a great Savior who drew his strength from that great God, we have victory. Not because of anything we have done, but because of what was done for us. And so I really feel that Jesus spent this Wednesday living out further verse along in that psalm, the 46th psalm, the 10th verse. It says, be still and know that I am God. As a society, we're not very good at that. Silence is something that needs to be filled. Or as I feel God would have us embrace the silence. Because a lot of times the distractions of this world get so loud, the distractions of this world get so intense that we miss that still small voice that is speaking to us and instructing us where we should go, what we should do. We need to learn to be still. In the first church I ever served in, I was one of two members of the congregation who had a commercial driver's license, so I could drive the 25-passenger bus. Guess what I spent a lot of time doing? <laughs> Driving the 25-passenger bus. I took our senior adults to a retreat. And it was a retreat about an hour from the church, and it was a little cabin in the woods in the absolute middle of nowhere. I had no idea where I was. Thank goodness somebody was directing me, or we never would have found still be wandering around. And they said, you want to come in and go to our retreat with us. I said, I really do appreciate that, but I have some phone calls I need to make and I have some work I need to get done. So I was planning on sitting on the bus and working for about three hours that they were there. Well, I sat there and made my phone calls and I was getting my laptop out and ready to get some work done and I decided I needed to stretch my legs. And so I just walked about 100 yards away from that bus and I found myself a little hill over a little babbling brook. And it was just one of the most peaceful places I had been to in a very long time. You know what I did? I went back to the bus. I put my laptop away. I went back up to that hill. And God and I spent some time. And let me tell you, when I got back, I was behind on my to-do list. But my goodness gracious, my soul was full. And I think that's what Jesus was doing on this Wednesday. And while there's nothing at all wrong with resting to recover, I think praying to prepare is a much better way of doing things. It's the only way that we can face tomorrow. It's the only way we can face what this world throws at us. And Jesus taught us this by strengthening himself, by spending time with his Father. Like I said before, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me too. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings you give us, Father. I just pray that you will help us to lean on you in absolutely everything that we do. Because, Father, I am not strong enough to face this world and to serve you. I need your strength. And help me, Lord, to recognize where my power comes from. And help all of us, Lord, to invest the time that we have between now and Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and then the wonderful Resurrection Sunday. Invest that time opening our hearts to you so that you can lead us and guide us. And so 
we can be fully, fully invested in our awesome and wonderful God. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray. Please turn in your hymn, we'll do hymn 185, and today we will stand and sing stanza three together. Thank you. 